Good afternoon. Welcome to the first campus-wide leadership series of 2017. Uh, this is, uh, I'm Robert Klein, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and what I want to do is thank the KU Hospital and my own office, Office of Academic Affairs. We share the costs on this program. We are streaming to uh, all the, whatever you want to call them, I guess, multi-campus sites of the University of Kansas Medical Center, so even though I can't see them, I welcome the people who, the streamers. So it's better than streakers, I guess, okay. And my job is to uh, introduce Marty McLaughlin. I think many of you know Marty. Uh, we started out uh, 11 years ago and uh, about nine days uh, in the office, uh, what was it? PUDFA, Professional Development Faculty Affairs in the School of Medicine. And one of Marty's things has been the campus-wide leadership series. It started there, took about a two-year hiatus, and we brought it back last year. I think it is a really good program where folks from the hospital and from the university get to sit next to each other and uh, ask questions of uh, guests and hear 
I call them stories. Uh, they're not fictional, uh, but stories of people's lives and transitions. And I, I think it helps all of us to hear how other people mastered uh, various points in their lives. That's about all I think I need to uh, say uh, and introduce Marty, who's going to introduce Dr. Reed. So away we go. Um, I have had the delightful pleasure of getting to know Dr. Reed in the last two or three weeks with several conversations as well as reading his book. For those of you that haven't read his book, The Pulse of Hope, it's it's an incredible uh, story of a journey from poverty. And uh, in one of the pictures you'll see on the slides behind us, you'll see a cow where whose ribs are going because cow was even hungry, um, <coughs> to where he is today. And um, with the honor of the hospital naming the Heart Hospital after him, uh, he and his wife. Um, I'm not going to do a lot of detail of of his background, because that's what we're going to talk about, and it's also detailed in your handout. For those of you that are streaming, this will be recorded, and it will be on the web next week. The handout will be on the web, as well as the slides. So the slides are pretty much, so you understand the format today, are just, they're just going to run behind us as we talk through the evolution of his journey. Uh, we're really not going to be pointing to them, but you'll see a number of different things on them. So. They will be available to you next week on the line, on, online. Um, <clears throat> so let's begin. Um, if we talk about where you began in your life and the influence it had from where you grew up, your mom and dad, your siblings, your education uh, as a young child, um, and the circumstances that you had to overcome even before you started college or went into the military. Tell us about that story and what you learned from all of that. Thank you, Mark. The, um, growing up poor really gave uh, a different attitude to our life. Uh, my best friend growing up was uh, African American that lived across the alley from us. We lived out the edge of town. Children in our family. There was a period of time where we lived about eight months in the basement. We couldn't pay the rent from a small house. So we grew up uh, getting a. Uh, Five bucks, five dollars and thirty cents. I think I know that. Food for each week. Doctor Reed, we need to get your, your microphone mic. on. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. Those those technical things are beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I I think that the growing up poor gives you a different perspective on life. And it, uh, the thing that it, there are two or three thing, critical things that it does. It, is, it gives you uh, the idea and conviction that, uh, that uh, poverty is, is a tougher road, but it's not a wall. And uh, with hard work, you can overcome things. And, uh, and failure, if, you, if, you, if there are not periods of time when you failed at something you want to do, it makes you tougher to come back and try something more. You know, so poverty kind of sets the stage for you to face the tough times that may lie ahead. The, uh, <clears throat> I went from that uh, atmosphere to uh, being very competitive in school. And they, I always had fun when they did ciphering contests and that sort of thing. Because I, 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 I wasn't the smartest kid in the class, but. But I could add things up in my head or subtract them in my head. And by the time the teacher had listed these things on the blackboard, I could give the answer. So that's how I got even for the other kids in the class that had new books they brought with them to class. When you got new books, I, I, I always got the used books because we couldn't buy the new ones. But so um, in high school, I was very, very fortunate to have a 
a teacher, Chet Thompson, who was my teacher in, in the machine shop. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't take the, I had no, no prospect of going to college at all because of my financial situation. So I was in a vocational course in high school. I didn't take preparation in algebra, that sort of thing. And the, uh, but uh, Chet Thompson, my, my teacher, uh, took me to Lions Club for lunch on Thursdays. Best meal I had in the week. And then, uh, and then toward the end of uh, high school, he took me to a couple of football games at Duke University. And he, I know that Chet saw something in me that most people didn't, and that I probably didn't realize myself, but he, he, was, the, he was the key person in my growing up that uh, gave me some a measure of a self-esteem. So I think that's kind of where we were when we went off, to, when I finished high school. Okay. How did your mom and your dad influence the way you see the world? Because they both had an influence that was different. Yeah, my dad, uh, my dad's family had a, a great cattle operation in the in the twenties, and they lost everything in the twenty nine crash. And he never recovered from that. He was an angry man from that point forth. And uh, my mother, uh, God bless her, was <clears throat> trying to feed eight kids, and she had a part time job. And uh, it was she that uh, influenced all of us to, to uh, want to accomplish something ourselves. She saw a value in each of us. I, very poignant moment for me was when I was about nine years old, standing in the kitchen when she was frying some chicken. And we had, and I said, Mom, isn't it great that we can have, we can have meat once a week? And she started crying. So it, the, I don't blame my dad if you have eight kids to feed or 10 mouths to feed and you don't have the means to do it. That's an enormous pressure on your parents. So my dad was angry and never got over it. My mother was always persistent in saying there's something better here. And she was the one that pointed us in the direction of hard work and amounting to something, as mm -hmm. you put it. And finding value in, uh, yeah. in little things. I remember in your book you talked about that. Yeah, she, uh, if she saw something pretty, a flower or something like that, she would, she would point it out to me that there was something beautiful. And I think that that was her influence on me and being observant of those things that are beautiful around. You. Yeah. You, mentioned, you did mention... Uh, the vocational instructor, the, the shop teacher taking yeah, you. Chuck Thompson, um, yeah. I, I told him I get a little bit of privilege in doing this because uh, I get to ask a question that's interesting to me, um, as they all are, but this one in particular. Vocational ed has been taken out of many, many schools today, replaced with college prep courses. And I've kind of of the belief that that's sad because we've lost so much and we're losing populations. From your class, what did you learn that you were able to apply later in medicine? Well, I, I could do things with my hands. I was good at that. I used to like to tear things apart, see if I could put them back together when I was a little kid. And the, uh, the cardiac surgery is, uh, is very oriented toward how, how nimble you are with your hands and, and how you hand-eye coordination and uh, being able to, in the early days of cardiac surgery, they, we often, I often opened the chest without knowing for sure what we were going to encounter. We didn't have echoes, we didn't have really good angiography at that time. And so it was important to be able to innovate. On the, when you opened and found something you didn't expect, you had to say, well, I can fix that doing so and so and so and so. And the, uh, the other thing it did was that uh, I always tried to, re when we're later in, on in my career, when we were recruiting somebody to join our surgical group, I always tried to, f if it was easy for me to find somebody smarter than me. Uh, that wasn't a hard jo job at all. I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. 
but the uh, but but at the same time, the confidence that I had in the operating room and setting an example. It's not about me here tonight or today. It's about what we're going to do together. So it's putting a value <coughs> on those people that are there with you. And that's what leadership's all about. And so I was able to confidently enter the operating room and know that I could do, the, do it as well or better than anybody. And. Uh, and that's what carried me through many, many different elements of my life. Getting past high school, how did you end up in college? How did you get through college? Tell us that journey because, well, the, you know... Uh, it was kind of fun. The, um, when I finished high school, as a, a, out of high school, I weighed 120 pounds. And I got a job very briefly for about a month. They was, the war was still going on. And uh, I joined, the, my two brothers were in the service, in the Air Force. And I joined the Navy kind of to be a little different. And I came home, and two, mu and two months after boot camp, I came home for a brief visit. I weighed 182 pounds. So that's what three meals, <laughs> three meals a day can do for you. <laughs> so I, the, uh, but I, but, and we'll get into this, but I can go on, I think, and talk about a little bit about when I got out of the Navy, I was being discharged down in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, the night before I was going to be discharged home. And I, I it came to me, what am I going to do when I get out of the Navy? And it occurred to me that I was going to be a doctor. That's the way it happened. That's just the way it happened. And uh, that was ridiculous because I had no preparation for college at all. I didn't have any of the setup for algebra or language or any of those things that the kids were in academic courses had been prepared for college. So I, I went home and kind of worked for two years and I was eligible for the GI Bill. And I went from there, Kokomo, down to Indiana. Okay. What was the medical school path? How did that come into play? And how did you end up in uh, 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 surgery, of all things? Well, from... yeah, that's kind of interesting, really, because the, uh, I, uh, my path was uh, in, in college. I, I, I had to kind of, if I had put my algebra book here so I could get through the physics things like that, so I'd kind of fill in the things that I hadn't had in high school. And in med school, the, uh, I <clears throat> earned my way through, I used my GI Bill for the end of my two years of pre-med. And then uh, in the freshman year was in Bloomington at that time, it's now in Indianapolis. And when I moved to Indianapolis, I got a job at, uh, at doing, uh, drawing bloods in the morning at a, at a psychiatric hospital, a private high school psychiatric hospital. So I got acquainted with all of the psychiatrists, private psychiatrists in town. And, uh, and then the polio epidemic was going on in the latter part of my med school. And I, uh, I worked in the polio, with Bulbar polio, where they had three drinker respirators. And I was kind of the muscle for the nurses to move patients around inside the drinker and uh, got acquainted with uh, the effects of that. And um, so I and then I had a job at the uh, Methodist Hospital doing electroencephalograms. So I got through high school, I uh, got through medical school, uh, worked my way through, and then met my wife. At, uh, she rotated through as a nurse from a private hospital in Muncie, Indiana. And I met her there. And I was playing ping pong with a, one of the patients in the recreation room. She thought I was one of the patients. <laughs> She's not convinced this this day that wasn't the case. <laughs> so uh, we were then um, we fell in love, and, and uh, as soon as I was out of med school, we were married. Yeah. 
Now, I remember it was either college or, or uh, med school or something that you lived someplace strange. Uh, in the, it wasn't a dorm, it wasn't an apartment, it was something related to med school, wasn't it? Am I remembering that correctly? No, well, we lived in, in, the, we lived in the private mental hospital. In the mental hospital itself. Yeah, we yeah. lived on the third floor. Yeah. And we got up in the morning and drew the bloods on the patients and then, and then they packed us a lunch. They had breakfast, had practice for lunch. Then the three of us were three of us there and we took turns taking call okay. at night as students. I just find it amazing. And, you know, he told me yesterday he finished med school without any debt. Mm -hmm. How's that for working your way through med school? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> so you married Mary right after you got out of med school. Right. And I know that, that our young professionals struggle with uh, family and starting their careers and uh, the work-life balance is a real common theme on campus, and, and you seem to handle it really well. They've been married for 63 years. And so in the beginning and even throughout the 63 years, what could you describe for us as strong characteristics of the marriage? And I'm not just talking about saying marry. Wait, that's an obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but what would be the characteristics and the things that helped you balance along the way? Well, I, I, I think the, uh, Mary's a beautiful woman, but at least she was just as beautiful inside as outside. But she had her own passions. She had her own things that she wanted to do. One of them was wanting to have kids. I went blessed with those until we had three in a row after seven years. But, but she... Um, during, our, during my residency here and during my training period here, she worked, uh, she taught OB and here for a number of years and worked in the recovery room. And uh, she, we always respected each other's desires and passions. And I never made a decision that, that didn't include her wisdom. And we would, we, I spent, we spent probably walked 500 miles before I decided to leave in 1971. But uh, Mary was, uh, she was a special, is a special kind of person. And I, I think that um, we, early on for the young people here and for everyone, I guess, the, uh, my, we strive to have a balanced life. And, uh, and you know, and you've seen physicians that are probably here longer than they should be at night. Uh, and it's selfish to, to expect your wife or your spouse to accept the fact that you're the most important person there. And you have to respect each other and hear each other's passions. And I know that uh, I remember vividly when I was a resident in thoracic surgery here, and I had spent, uh, we had a, a young 12-year-old girl that had a pulmonary valvotomy and it took her two days to die. Scarlett Bates is her name. And I have spent uh, 48 hours straight at her bedside, maybe for an hour or two at a time, I'd sleep on a gurney outside the door. We didn't have, a, didn't have intensive care in those days. And uh, after those two days, I was walking home. I lived over in Cambridge. I was walking home and I, and I got home and I told my wife, I told Mary that maybe this is not what I should be doing. And she said, this is what you were chosen to do. You're tired. And she was right. The, the privilege of being someone who puts their, patient puts their life and trust in you. You owe that to them to give, to do the same for them in return. And, uh, She's, she was she was by she was by champion. That's good. Still is for that matter. I know. I've heard him talk about this for three weeks. It's yeah. amazing. It's wonderful. <coughs> In your training and residency periods, uh, and you reflect back um, after college and military, how did you end up in surgery from the? Uh, you know, from working in psychiatry or in that institution. Yeah. Well, that's quite a flip from psychiatry to 
cardiac surgery. About a flip, big a flip as you can make. But I, but I, uh, I came to, Marin and I came to Kansas in 1954, and I was intent on going to, to Menninger's to become a psychiatrist. And uh, one of the, the confounding parts there was the Korean War was still going on. And in order for me to stay in med school, I had to take a commission in the Navy as a Navy medical officer. I was in already as a machinist mate, and I thought that would have been enough, but, but the law required me to. And so when I came here, the Korean War was still going on. Well, the Korean War stopped while I was here. And uh, my chairman, Dr. Frank Albritton, who's my chairman of my department of surgery at that time, asked me if I'd like to be an extra resident in surgery. And I enjoyed the uh, surgical rotations and it was a chance to use my hands and, and find out what surgeons did. And uh, I, did, I don't think that it's as big a flip as you might think. Because if you can imagine, the, if someone walked into your room and told you you're going to have to have a heart operation tomorrow, uh, you, need some, you need some skills in how to deal with emotional uproar and that sort of thing. And, uh, and it's, the thing that it uh, has that done for me is that it, it's guided my own thinking more toward philosophical things and what life's about. And uh, there's an old song by Peggy Lee, she sings, because what's it all about? If that's what it's all about, I'll just keep on dancing. And so it's, uh, and I've continued that pursuit of the poetry to me is, is dealing with some of the mysteries of life. And uh, there, our language takes us to a point where, um, the, our usual language doesn't help you express yourself. And, and, uh, and poetry then gets, uh, helps you deal with a mystery. And, the, uh, and uh, you know, the, I grew up in the, 60s, in the 60s, I was here when, when some of the real revolutionary things were happening. And uh, how, how many of you, rem I'll give you a couple of lines. Uh, then you see if you can tell me who wrote them. How many times must a man walk down this road before he can call it, before they'll call him a man? And how many times must a white dove sail before she can rest in the sand? Does anybody, does anybody hear? Yeah. Bobby Dylan's Blowing in the Wind. That's right. And that was a great song. In the, and Bobby Dylan... Received the Nobel Prize for Literature this year. <laughs> it was a team effort, it sounds like, over there. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> the, uh, and I'll, give you, I'll give you another challenge. Who, who wrote these lines? Um, when, when, was it, when was it ever less than a treason to go with the drift of things? and yield with a grace to reason, and bow and accept the end of a loverous season. Who wrote that? Anybody? No, come on. <laughs> Robert Frost. Oh, you said it. You said it right here, but didn't say it. You said it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay, talking about the pioneer days, and, and I mean, you know how many rules and regulations and things that are in place today that you can't do without approval and without all kinds of things going on in medicine, but as a pioneer, a lot of that didn't exist, and tell the story about uh, when you were a resident, or was it a student, with the animal research and and running the night before and getting something out of the lab and taking it into the OR to ask Yeah, well, I, oh, I, I mentioned a little bit of that before, but the, uh, I was working in the cath lab or I, as in second year resident. I was working over in the animal laboratory. That was required to rotation during our second year. 
And I was working with a, uh, an oxygenator, it's what called a bubble oxygenator, two sheets of plastic and blood bubbled up and then you, the bubbles that were dispensed and you pumped it back in the patient. It's one of those early crude uh, ways of, of putting a patient on extracurricular circulation. That's what I was doing in the lab with dogs. And uh, my mentor here, Dr. Fred Kittle, and uh, Dr. Frank Albritton, and Dr. Albritton was scrubbed to the first open heart case done at Philadelphia, Jeff Medical College in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, uh, were going to were going to operate on a little boy, Roger Pace, the next morning. And so I took the uh, the the apparatus I'd been working with in the dog lab, and I'd been able to get dogs through two hours on this pump, and have them survive. So we took that over to the main operating room. I took it over about midnight on the elevator and took it up to the fifth floor. And the, uh, the next morning we did the uh, Roger Paces, had a ventricular septal defect repaired by Dr. Albert and Dr. Kittle. And I ran the heart-lung machine. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a time when things were being developed and we're doing a lot of things that we didn't appreciate were very, very negative for the patient. And the, uh, that little boy survived, and the next nine died. And uh, so it was at a time when John Kirkland, who was a famous surgeon from the Mayo Clinic, did the first few open heart cases with a, with a different kind of, kind of oxygen here. It was one that was invented at Jefferson Medical College. But he would, uh, I think he had, he did nine, first nine cases, I think four, four, four of them died. And Dr. Kirkman would go down to the Kaler Hotel at the Mayo Clinic and go up to a room and sit down and spend the night looking out the window. I mean, it was an enormous emotional experience. And that's what we went through in those early days of doing open heart surgery. And now we, you know, when I went into practice at a private hospital, I think I did the first 39 patients without a mortality. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of things that changed. Mm -hmm. But that was as a resident. And then I told the story about later on when I was, uh, when I was a senior resident, thoracic surgery and, and going home, mm -hmm. talking to Mary about it. Yeah. <coughs> Mentoring. Mentoring. You have had some mentors in your life, and I think uh, that um, there's so many things we could be talking about. So I'm trying to pick and choose some of the things that I'm remembering, and I'm I'm hoping I'm bringing from him some of the things that you're finding of interest as as I have along the week weeks that have gone by. With mentoring, sometimes we have tough talks with mentees or have been talked to toughly by a mentor. Can you tell us a lesson that you learned from something that a mentor said that maybe you didn't expect to hear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, the, uh, I was, uh, after I finished my training, I came on the staff, medical staff here. And my mentor, Dr. Fred Kittle, was, was my principal mentor. And uh, about two weeks after I joined the faculty, I was doing a, uh, I had a patient I was doing a, a closed mitral valvotomy on. A closed mitral stenosis was common in those days, it still is, as a matter of fact. But the, um, that was my, one of my first patients. And in doing a, a closed mitral valvotomy, you put your index finger in the left atrial appendage where you can feel the mitral valve narrowing. And then with your other hand, put a, an instrument in the apex of left ventricle, and you can feel it up the instrument pass up through that narrowed valve, and then you squeeze on a handle and it separates the valve. Uh, the, uh, you, you prep to do that by putting a first string suture around the atrial appendage and one around the apex of the ventricle. Well, I, everything was going fine, and I, when I squeezed the handle, the ventricle fibrillated. Well, now we have no circulation and normal temperature you got about a minute and a half to you get brain injury. And I said quietly under my, to the anesthesia person, would you call Dr. Kittle? And Dr. Kittle's office was about, oh, 
30 feet from where we were, just around the corner outside the OR. And he sent back an immediate message, it's time to grow up. And uh, so I, my assistant, I took my finger out of the left after appendage, the assistant squeezed down the first train, took it out of the left, instrument out of the left ventricle, assistant squeezed down the first train, put the pads on the heart, defibrillated the heart, patient did fine. It was a time when he had more confidence in me than I had in myself. And I think that that, that seems kind of harsh in a way. <laughs> but, but, it, uh, but he knew that I had to do what could be done. It would, he couldn't help me at that point. He couldn't help me. And uh, about two weeks later, I was doing a coarctation repair. And you, or you have a narrowing of the aorta just beyond the origin of the left subclavian artery. And um, I had a clamp on each end, and I had to sew the two ends together. And I had run the suture on the back side of that junction. And I put the instrument with the needle holder, and the needle still in the needle holder back here. And the nurse took hold of the needle holder and did this. And I ended up with something that looked like a, like a, a Halloween mat, a Halloween pumpkin that tore the whole backside out, both ends. The, um, I think there are things that you, uh, well, it wasn't intentional at all. I, I simply trimmed that off and put it together. But, uh, but I think the, uh, there are times when you're going to have someone say, you're, you're ready. So just buck up and let's get it done. <laughs> and you have those of you who are around residents or are, are in training programs, and your mentor thinks you're ready, then you've got to go do it. It's time. And who was it that said you were going to be a good surgeon if? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the other the other, <laughs> the other lesson I had was that. Uh, Speaking, speaking uh, truth to power is just not a good thing sometimes. <laughs> and uh, I was on a rotation down in Wichita, and, and it was part of our training, and I was third year resident. And uh, my, my senior, my, my chief down there was uh, Al Hinshaw. And um, they, uh, they assigned me as, I was the only resident there. And so I, I was a little surprised when the schedule came out that I was going to take internal medicine patients as well. Well, I, I thought, I'm, I, 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 don't, I could care less if I'm up all night taking care of a surgical patient, but I, I think it's a little exploiting me a bit to give me an assignment in internal medicine. So I called Dr. Albright and I told him what the situation was. And he came down the next day and had a discussion with the people there. And, and it was all squared away. And when I was doing my exit interview after that rotation with Dr. Inshaw, he said, uh, Bill, you could probably be a pretty good surgeon if you don't get fired before you get through. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be a little bit, a bit measured when you're speaking truth to power. But I, but I became a little more skillful about things like that. And uh, try to see things from the perspective of the person that you're discussing it with. And uh, I, there's another rule that you never, ever admonish or correct somebody in public or before someone else. You do that privately. And you do it by trying to, when you're in the operating room, I, they knew that I was going to give them all I had, the best I could do. And they also knew that I expected them to give that patient everything they had, the best they could. And the, uh, they have to be part of, of that. They have to, you have to be there together. It's not what I'm going to do, it's what we're going to do. That's what it's all about. Family man. Family man kind of developed during his training with the birth of the children. So how did you balance and keep sanity during building the career, raising children, 
you know, having a successful marriage, um, the stress of the kind of patients you were dealing with, how did you balance all of that and what did you do to help that family situation? Well, it, it's part of your, it's selfish for you to put it all in the hospital. <coughs> and uh, I think leading a balanced life is very important. We've talked about that. When I, when I got home in the hospital, I, I, usually I was there for dinner. And uh, I would, we had three boys. I'd pop them in the bathtub and give them their baths and tell them stories and put them to bed myself. And, the, uh, and when they're grown up, we would they'd go skiing together, we'd go fishing together. We'd go to watch the horses run together. We did things together. That's, it's so important. And, you know, the, there's a song out there, I don't remember the tune at all or the words, but, but it's, uh, it, I don't have time now sort of song. And we'll do it later. Uh, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. We'll do cats it. in the Cradle. And then they're grown the up. Cats in the Cradle? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. So uh, you have to do it together. Yeah. And uh, Mary was, she deserved that. And she deserved my attention away from medicine. Um, so with the hobbies that you had, Horses came into play, and again, that was part of the family thing, but um, talk to us a little bit about the experience well, of Well, you know, I think it was Churchill that said, the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man. And uh, I, one of the things we do at the farm is we, with the farm and the, and the horses, we make that as, as, a, as an asset to the community. Mm -hmm. Mary's been behind uh, the restarting the, the Maui Patrol. Uh, we have uh, in the summertime and spring and fall and winter sometimes, we have uh, 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 buses bring people from, from uh, extended care facilities and, and nursing homes to come and see the horses and then Mary has a little lunch for them. There may be 15 or 20 people. And we have a, we have a golf cart that holds 14 people. And uh, those that can't are not very mobile you, the horse will walk, one of her horses will walk down, loves it, walks down each side of the horse of the butt, butt and sticks his head in. They can love on him and feed him and care. That's fun. And, uh, but, but it's, uh, the other thing about it is that uh, we planned this when I was planning on cutting back in my workload. And, uh, and it was also something we could do as a family. And uh, there's a perfect drift is our horse at Grand Third in the Derby. Uh, we, we bought his mom, we, we did the mating of the, with a stallion called Dinah Farmer. And Drift grew up in a field right in front of our kitchen. And uh, he took us all over the country. Yeah. And the thing about him was, that, and still is, if I walk by his stall, even today, he might reach out and try to bite me. <laughs> he, but. But if it was a woman, no problem. If it was a kid, they could walk in the stall and pet him. And if my favorite picture of him is with, a, with a, one of his fans, and the person, the husband is in a wheelchair, his wife is pushing him up to the webbing in front of his stall. He's got his head down in the lap of the man in the wheelchair. Now don't tell me that horses don't understand people. They remember when you're not nice to them. <coughs> they remember, uh, and they're very, he was very competitive. In his first race at Churchill Downs, he, he was in a 12 horse field and he's on the inside hole. So he had to go to the lead in order to not be carried out on the turns and so on. And, we, and he was still in the lead about two jumps from the finish and a horse beat him just by a nose. He reached over and tried to bite him. <laughs> And the, uh, so it's, uh, he's, he's very, very, he was always very, very competitive. But he didn't like veterinarians, but unless they were female. <laughs> and uh, we were running for the, for the Gold Cup, the Hawthorne Gold Cup one year. And he wouldn't let, the, the male vet came by and he wouldn't let him in the stall to give him his Lasix before he ran. They do that routinely. And uh, my trainer's girlfriend was a female vet. 
She was about 5'2 and 120 pounds. And she came over and said, get over there, Drift. He got over and she gave him a shot of Plasix. Pat him on the butt and she said, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> but to see them coming down the lane in a tight race, it's like watching one of your kids go to the final shot in a basketball game or going for the touchdown in a football game. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. They become a member of the family. All right, let's move on to um, developing your vision. And, you know, you've heard him say he came back here for training, and then he joined the faculty and was here at KU for a number of years. Part of the vision of building a career, and some of you may be going through this or have already gone through it uh, or are thinking about it, when you develop a vision of what you want to do next, there's a lot of steps involved. And sometimes it even involves thinking, well, how come they won't let me do that? And how am I going to get this done here? And deciding, do you stay or do you go? It's kind of like we have in the slide the song of, you know, when to fold them and when to hold them. And, and so tell us a little bit about your journey along that line. Right. I, and I, I wanted to stick to that. The, uh, at, at 1970, and, and it was apparent that I wasn't going to be able to realize my vision of what I wanted to do. In the, in, the, in the 60s, I kind of honed my own skills and formed my vision. And my vision was to build a great cardiovascular program. And the bed limitations and so on were not, realistically, would not be here. Yeah. So I moved to St. Luke's and we started the program there with Ben McAllister and some other folks there and dedicated the heart hospital there in 1980. And then uh, there were some turmoil and so on in the, in the 1998 and 99 and so on. And uh, we decided to, uh, the, Dr. Steve Owens was president of their, of the of Mid-American Cardiology at that time. And uh, Steve and I uh, worked about a year with Irene Cumming working out our vision for reestablishing the program here. And we knew what would work. Irene knew what would work and what they needed. Mm -hmm. And so we put together the new program here. And uh, we did that over a long negotiating process. But Steve and I, Steve negotiated the deal in cardiology and in surgery. But it, we came as a group to do that. And uh, so that's kind of that. And, and it's okay. history from there. So the leaving and coming back was all about coming all. fulfilling the vision and, and where you needed to be to do that, exactly. right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to, I skipped over a slide to get to the one with Steve. I'm going to back up to the one with the picture of the heart. One of my favorite stories he told me is what it's like to transplant a heart. Will you tell that story? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the first heart transplant I did was on June the 6th of 1985 at uh, St. Luke's Hospital. And, and, you, and in the operating room, when, and there was one done here last night, the, um, you look in, you remove the diseased heart after you've inspected the donor organ that's behind you. And you look in and, and you take out the diseased heart. And you look in and you see nothing but tubes and no heart in the body that's there. And it takes me, it takes me usually about 47 or 48 minutes to sew the new one in. And then you take off the clamp that restores blood flow to that transplanted heart, that, that gift from, wonderful gift from some bereaved family. And then everybody's standing there waiting as to what happens now. And waiting for that tentative first squeeze. And then the next squeeze. And then the next squeeze. And there, it's as a new home, a new life has been formed. A new union has been formed. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful privilege to be here, to be part of that. There's a hell of a lot I don't understand. But I stood at that patient's bedside the next morning, in the 3.30 in the morning, 
said, this night has changed my life. And, that, and that's what it does. And to be able to, I don't understand all of that, but that, an hour before that piece of meat was lying there, you couldn't, you couldn't separate from anything else. Yeah. But now it's, it's in a new body. I had a, a, a mother one time came up and said she wanted to see the person who had received her son's heart because she wanted to put her hand on her son. It's a, it, it's a, it's a profound experience. Can't imagine. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> we're moving along in time, and we do want to leave time for questions and answers, but there are a couple of other points I think we'd like to get across. One is um, he's been described as someone that is a servant leader. Would you talk to us a little bit about that? Tell yeah, us. Well, servant leadership is, there's a good bit written about it, and I've elaborated on it in my book, but, but I, I think that it's, and I've already mentioned that in peripherally a number of times. And the servant leader is the one who puts value on those people and those relationships that you form that help you reach an objective. And you do that by helping them grow. You do that by being patient and, and willing to teach. You do that by respecting them and what they have to offer. And, the, um, and, the, and they can be part of a you know, the, uh, Peter Drucker is a famous uh, consultant and was touring a, a building site where they were building a large church. And there were three masons there, and one of them said, what is your job? And he said, well, I put this brick on top of this brick. And the next one, he said, well, I'm building this wall. And the last one said, I'm building a cathedral. And so what you want in servant leadership is to put those folks together with you and you're going to create that vision that you dreamed of and they're going to be part of that vision and they can say, this is what we help do. Okay, um, I think you've touched a little bit on the poet and philosopher mm -hmm. uh, side of you. I think that comes from, in his book he talks about there's three sides of everybody's life. There's the public, the private, and the secret. And many of you may not realize that um, he is a poet. He has written uh, a number of poems that are in the book. But I think the secret side of that is how they've been a strength for you throughout your career, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because again, the stress in that life of dealing with patients like that and the kinds of surgeries and the 10,000 open heart surgeries he's performed in his life or more than that, something has to keep you grounded. And I think this has been a... Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you have to have a little area to retreat to. And there were times that Mary recognized that I needed some alone time. And uh, in that alone time is when you can connect with who you are. It may, maybe it's reading uh, uh, something of Dostoevsky that Brothers Karamazov, or maybe it's a poem. Maybe it's Mary Oliver, who's one of my favorite poets. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she said that poets are not just words, they're ropes let down to the lost. They're food for the hungry. They're fuel for the fire. So, uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the book of, uh, of the road, that they talk about carrying the fire. So you, and the passion for what you do. And I find that, that poetry gives me that urge to continue to look at the mystery of life. And, uh, and, and our language, English language, it isn't able to express that part that becomes that you can't to put into regular words. And the poets can do that. And uh, there comes a time when it becomes an emotional experience rather than an intellectual experience. Along in his life with all of the wonderful things he's accomplished and done, he's also 
Uh, he and his wife both are uh, incredible philanthropists. They have given so much to this community, to this facility. The, I think he mentioned earlier that Mary was uh, instrumental in starting the mounted police patrol for the Kansas City Police. Um, and, you know, the Heart Hospital and many, many other things that are listed in that handout that you have. But I think one of the remarkable things, too, besides just giving funds to get things going and to help others, he still handwrites notes to people mm -hmm. that contact him and that... Uh, and, and to individuals that he knows. And that's, uh, as I said to him, that's kind of a lesson we can all learn from, including me, because it is so personal and it is so giving of yourself to handwrite a note to express something to someone. Well, it, it's safer, too, with immediate, with immediate communication. <laughs> the, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, <coughs> I've, written, a, I've, I've written a letter and then not sent it. But it, with, with computers being what they are, you can respond in a very negative way and wish the hell you hadn't done so the next day. <laughs> so if you think about it a little bit, it takes you time to think about it. You can handwrite something. And, uh, but it is more personal. It takes more time. Yeah. And before we adjourn, I, I do want to tell you that uh, we're, the, th the most recent thing we've been working on is something we should have worked on a long time ago. There will be a new sanctuary multi must be all kinds of denominations as you come into the main entrance of the hospital and turn toward the heart hospital there's going to be there will be a sanctuary there and across the respite room just across from it and uh, that'll be finished in January this month so there'll be a dedication to that but it's something that we uh, we wanted to be sure and Charlie Porter is a great uh, photographer and Charlie has a picture there that is so inspirational that you you have to see it to really believe it. But it's something that uh, that it will be a refuge for people that, particularly with the transplant, where people are facing the death of mm -hmm. someone and the gift that that is, and it will be a source for people to come and pray, or if they're inclined in that direction, or to come and. Thank, give thanks. Have a quiet moment. And a quiet moment. At this point, this gentleman that's going to be turning 90 soon is still working <laughs> here, <laughs> which makes me feel guilty for wanting to be in phased retirement at 64. <laughs> makes me, it inspires me to think about that next career that I'm going to have. But Anyway, I'd like to turn it to the audience now. We do have some microphones because you're going to be asking questions of him. And both of us, I won't be able to re repeat the question to him because I can't hear either. So we need you on the microphone to hear your questions. Dr. Klein, I think, has, at le or somebody has at least a couple questions. Alexa has one back there. Please feel free to ask whatever questions you would like of, of Dr. Reed. Well, instead of a question, I mainly have a comment. Uh, I've been here almost 40 years, and you've been such a great role model for physicians uh, and getting them to accept uh, the other members of the healthcare team as a team, and that expressing the point that medicine needs to be a team sport. And, and your emphasis on quality and safety has really, really helped make KU what it is today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have another question or comment? Anyone? Down here? <coughs> Dr. Reed, I would estimate you've trained at least 50 surgical residents uh, mm -hmm. in your career, perhaps more. Have you developed a philosophy, not so much technique, you know, which you're certainly going to give, but more of a, a moral philosophy that you share with your residents that you hope in the course of two or three years you can, you know, get them to understand. Yeah, the, the residents will vary in their technical skills. You, know, you want them to be safe and good. But the, but the most important thing to me is the good doctors are at the bedside. The good doctors listen. The patient will tell you what's wrong if you listen. But the, but the ones that I see and what I try to help them understand is that 
you have a great privilege of somebody putting their life in your hands. It's up to you then to fulfill that and make that privilege valid. And uh, so I, I pay a lot of attention to how close they are to the patient when the patients are not doing well. And the, uh, if a nurse called me in the middle of the night, I, didn't get, I never, ever gave them a hard time about calling them. I thanked them. And uh, if, if the nurse or resident called me, I was out of bed to go see what was going on. I remember when we had our first introductory things here, we, uh, we, what we did, a couple of things we did was to uh, set up, realize that the nursing staff was critical. And so we valued that. And uh, the house staff, if, uh, if the house staff were, were doing what I would hope that they would be doing, it would be listening to the nurses and listening to the people there at the bedside and not giving them a hard time about calling them in the middle of the night. Uh, it, it, you, you, have to, you have to really be very aware, and I was always very aware of the resident who says, well, it's six o'clock, it's time for me to go home, see you, bud. The, the patient may be bleeding. If you help them do that patient, they need to be there. That was part of what they, who they should be. If they go out and practice somewhere, patient trusts them with their life. They have to be willing to be there. That's part of who they are. So uh, that's what I look for in, in residents, and that's what I expected. You'll be interested to know that Max Allen, an internist that I'm right. sure you for a number of years used to emphasize, listen to the patient, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. Exactly. We realize that some of you need to leave because it's, it's right at one o'clock, but we'll, he's more than willing to stay and answer more questions or, or discuss anything with you. If you can show us a, a quick show of hands, he's also offered to host a session where he will be happy to discuss his book or poetry or anything that you would like to just sit and have a conversation about. If we schedule that, how many of you would be interested in, in attending? Okay. All right, good. Then we, what I'll do is I'll look for a time and a location, and I'll send an announcement to the people that attended today of when that will be. And then you can just sign up and let us know. Thank you. And those of you that want to stay, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.